Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Is my microphone on? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay, there we are. We're switched on. My name is Bob Pickard. I'll be uh, moderating our panel uh, this morning. I'm really intrigued by this, this topic because I've always wondered if crowdsourcing is going to lead to a, a miracle breakthrough drug or maybe a cure for cancer. And I would like to start our discussion by asking my panelists what they think about that query. Maybe Pedro, you may have an opinion on this. Well, you know, I have an opinion. I don't for sure have a final answer for that. But I think what we are finding is that, you know, users, the crowd in general is already helping finding solutions, not necessarily for cancer, not yet for cancer, but for other diseases. Um, when people suffer from a chronic disease, they have a strong incentive to do something about it. Uh, the incentive is there. Uh, pharmaceuticals are already finding that patients are out there, users are out there, and they can use that crowd, which is a very particular crowd. But of course, they can also use another crowd, uh, the crowd that has nothing to do with healthcare itself, or, or, or with the disease itself, but can help as well. So I think so. I mean, over, yeah, as we grow in terms of the knowledge that we build around crowdsourcing methods, we will for sure see very significant developments, I believe, I think. Richard, do you have a view on this? Have you thought about this question at all? Not specifically about cancer, but... Uh, or a miracle drug. Well, a miracle everything. You, you, Solving these problems is not a single aha thing or moment. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it isn't. It's collaborative effort, it takes a long time, a lot of trial and error, a lot of investigation, particularly in drugs, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you want to figure out the population that responds best, that doesn't respond at all, that responds very adversely to it, sometimes known as death. Um, so these crowdsourcing tools become that, tools that help the manufacturer find the answers better, faster, cheaper. And every time you can do something better, faster, cheaper, on the other side is beneficial to everyone because then therefore is productivity by definition creates wealth, means that you can do more with the same or less budget. So yeah, it will clearly be a piece that will solve big problems like cancer and Alzheimer's and little problems Little not in the sense of how devastating they could be, but in the terms of the seven people in Portugal with the disease, right? Although collectively in the world, there'll be millions. So dear, this seems like a good place to bring you into the discussion. We heard from your colleague this morning, and you are talking about uh, healthcare and lifestyle. Uh, what do you think is the most exciting uh, applicability of crowdsourcing to what it is that you at Starhub are trying to accomplish? I think we're trying to do a number of things. Um, we're trying to bring, we believe in partnerships, and the whole idea here is to, to try to source for new types of solutions that would enable new, you know, uh, enable solutions to come into the market that would help uh, sufferers, people with disabilities to, um, you know, uh, to uh, bring solutions to the market that will help sufferers with with uh, with improvements in their lifestyle, you know. So, the the idea behind Crowdtivate, for example, our crowdsourcing platform was really to introduce um, assistive technologies. You know, one of the solutions that we have in there is a that look that is looking for funding is one which uh, addresses dyslexia uh, in children. So, uh, we hope that. Um, through these types of uh, efforts, we can bring new solutions to market that will help people in general. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And Adam, this morning you were talking about interoperability and overcoming some of the, the challenges of, of complexity here. I'm wondering, you having well advertised that, that's a big hurdle, that's a big barrier that has to be overcome. What is the, the, the most exciting opportunity that there is to leverage though? If we think about it, in a positive way, how would you choose to emphasize the, the power, the, the advantages here that, that you could address? The advantages as in, advantages of? Well, you talked about it's, you know, we, we have to thread the needle this way, we have to take syntax into okay, consideration. Okay. Um, so there are all these cautions and concerns. So what would be the things that, that we should think in a positive way or be excited about in, in an enabling way rather than a? Yeah, okay, um, I get the question. Um, 
I think definitely there's huge opportunity because a lot of times people working on interoperability are people who come to realize the um, the difficulties of it. And you get a bunch of technical people and a bunch of clinicians. We may not necessarily do it the best way. If we involve the patients, the crowd, they can actually provide better insights uh, to what is um, suitable for them. Because a lot of times we take things for granted because we see things from a certain perspective. We assume there's a common knowledge, common understanding, we're on the same page. Um, this may work well when you're trying to address uh, information gap, bridging information in the clinical setting. But a lot of time, we are actually trying to move towards wellness, towards health as well. And, and I have actually been guilty of this uh, several times when I talk to end users, I try to advocate, I try to raise awareness, and they're like, okay, there's some terms that they just don't understand. And when I take a step back, it's actually, um, you know, situations where I assume people are on the same level. So the crowd would definitely be a, a great source to to bring us back to reality at times, yeah. Okay, well now that we've heard from every member of the panel here, I wonder if we could open it up to questions from the audience. Who would like to, to lead us? So my question is around intellectual property in the crowd um, and how you see that playing out in the different situations where the crowd contributes either to a ve one particular person or a group of people make a huge contribution to something that's a breakthrough versus the collective um, intelligence aspect and how it plays with intellectual property. Well, speak from the United States, where suing each other is a national sport, and it's one I don't approve of, but nonetheless it exists. It's going to go through a couple of rounds of trial and error. The first place will start with platforms making it very clear, or if they're smart, they will make it very clear to the crowd that they have rights to nothing, and if that's the rule that they have to play with by. Or, in some cases, it could be that as some of these platforms may have an interest in giving uh, uh, property rights to the contributors, right? and therefore they will make that clear. Uh, so it all depends on the platform and what they've disclosed, and the lawyers will pick through the commas. They'll find that the comma was missing, therefore the meaning changed, therefore there's an opportunity to litigate, and eventually everyone will know where to put the commas, or where to place them, and so this will go away. And so some Platforms will make it a point to give property rights as an incentive, and other places will make it a point not to give any. And if you don't like it, don't play and go away. We don't want you if you don't like this rule. Anybody else want to tackle this one? Well, I can comment based on our experience at Patient Innovation um, because it's a very good question, a very important one for which we still don't have a good answer. But what happens once you disclose something is that you may prevent you know you or the author from actually doing a patent so it, it may be a problem it's not a problem for most patients because most patients are actually willing to share for free they don't even think about it they develop something with objective of using it so you know making money out of it it's not in their concerns but once it is successful and we have many of those examples, people actually sometimes do a patent or, you know, or protect it in one way or another. Uh, what we are also finding, and this was not planned as many things in our project, to be completely honest, is that it actually helps because once you put it on the site, you are protecting your own attribution. So, you know, there was a solution out there, nobody really knew who invented it. Once it is submitted and it's original, it actually shows to the world that you did it first. So it actually prevents other people from trying to protect it under his or her name. So, and this attribution is very important as well. If you didn't disclose enough on the site, this can be very helpful for the intellectual property protection. Yeah, but we still are you know, wondering how we should have, uh, or how I can, we can address that problem better, because it's a good question for which there's still no answer. Which country do you think is leading in healthcare innovation and what are the couple of things that set that, set that country apart from the others? Well, in terms of innovation per capita, Israel in life sciences, by any stretch of the imagination, they've got, what, 50 people living in Israel, that two, three million, and the amount of stuff that comes out there is just uh, frighteningly high on a per capita basis. I would imagine that on a total volume basis, it's the United States. Uh, but 
I don't know, I'm guessing here that that's where it is. And then you have some other countries that are all the time doing something. Uh, China's probably doing a lot, but they're not doing a lot of primary research yet, but they will. I think all the countries around the world, they would somehow face some sort of problem in some sort of different way, different contexts. And the key is, if there's a problem that no one is addressing, there will be someone who's coming up <coughs> with an innovative solution. The question, however, is does the, does the context, does the environment allow them to take it up to the next level? So you'll find innovation everywhere. I mean, if you talk to students in universities across the world, um, you talk to young people, they have great ideas. The question is, do they actually act on it? Or if they do, do they actually get shot for doing that? You know, you'd be surprised. Sometimes the Asia culture can, can do that. Yeah. I think my question is quite similar to the first question, which country, but I'm talking about third world countries. For example, India, have, there's a lot of innovation coming from the bottom of the pyramid, things like Jugat innovation. So what do you think we should be doing where there's limited access to internet to the third world countries, but there's a lot of good solutions coming from here. What's your opinion of that? Yeah, this question actually connects very well with the previous one, which I didn't answer, but I will try to actually connect it too, because if I had to answer that question without really pointing a country, I would probably say, you know, the countries where we see more innovation these days are emerging economies, because they have more problems. And, you know, if you find a place with a lot of needs, you know, these needs will translate into some solutions. Sometimes basic solutions that may not be helpful to everyone around the world. But often what we see is actually what you were pointing out. It's solutions that actually were first developed in emerging economies. Sometimes we call it the South. And then they become important in the North as well. And we saw that in telecom a lot, right? I mentioned mobile banking, but there's a lot in IT. Uh, lots of cool solutions for phones that were developed uh, uh, in places like Africa and many places in Southeast Asia uh, that later uh, were introduced in the US and in Japan and, in, and in, in Germany, in the places where we typically expected to see a lot of innovation. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, I do see emerging economies as the place for us to look for good ideas. Because, you know, if the need is the mother of inventions, yes, let's go to places of I need to look for good ideas. But more than that, to, to look for good solutions as well. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think problems are always local, and solutions have to be local too. Um, so, you know, solutions are not always portable. So a, a problem that exists in India, uh, relating to maybe access a uh, reach, for example, um, you know, you don't have similar problems in Singapore where you have, you know, you throw a stone uh, at someone and it'll hit a clinic, you know, uh, it'll hit a doctor. Uh, that's how pervasive clinics are here. So the nature of problems are very different, right? So it will, you know, um, so a lot of it does depend on the specific conditions in the country. Yeah, my question, well, first to start off on a comment on the first question, uh, have, has anyone looked at um, IT and the open source model that we have in IT to, um, to use the same type of model for the innovations that are happening in healthcare. And uh, related to that is um, in terms of monetizing these innovations, not necessarily monetizing the innovations for uh, necessarily the person who came up with the idea, especially if you go to the open source model, but more to generate uh, revenue in terms of feeding back into the system in order to encourage more of, of this uh, crowdsourcing. So, I, I mean, again, based on our experience in patient innovation, and that's all I can talk about, uh, we are seeing something similar to what I think you mean by the IT model, which is the crowd sometimes unrelated to the problem giving good solutions or helping solve a given problem. Um, Ivan Owen, the 3D printer guy, the puppeteer that you know used to be involved in theater and now is helping a lot of our patients is just one of those examples. But we, we have several examples like those. You know, uh, kids uh, that are, well, students that are doing engineering degrees in universities across the country in Portugal are now getting involved in developing of new solutions just because they like it, just because they have a lot of fun in the process of helping others. Um, 
so th I think that was your first question. Then you were thinking, uh, we were asking about monetizing, how can we make money out of this, which is something, again, that we are considering now in, in our platform. Is it, how can we look at some of these ideas from the patients, further develop them, eventually bring them to the market and, uh, 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 and make money, not just necessarily the platform, but the patient itself or himself or herself, no, not itself. But, uh, um, but we still don't have a good answer for that. So thank you for your question. If you have a good answer, share it with us. There's two, especially in medical devices, right? Which is an, even so in healthcare IT. And that is that if, if you have a device, you are going to have to spend uh, umpteen fortunes getting regulatory approvals. And once you go to market, two thirds of your budget, that's 60% of your budget, is cost of selling. Right, it's not R&D, it's, it's just the fact that you have to go out there and knock on doors and get purchase orders. And you're not going to go through all that expense prospectively if the world's going to help themselves to your innovation because it happens to be encumbered by the open source licensing. So yes, you will use open source operating systems. And one of my three companies that I'm incubating, one of the we are using... I don't even know what's it called, my CTO, I think CentOS, which is an operating system. And so the whole stack is all open source because it's free, it's maintained, there's an army of people making that better. But when we go to market, it's not going to encumber our real product, which is a software for producing optimal personalized dosages for drugs. That we wouldn't put open source in that layer of the algorithms because then you would say, oh, thank you. <laughs> You gave it to me, I'm going to go, and uh, since I start with a cost basis of zero, I can go sell it for one hundredth of what you can sell it because your cost basis is a lot of money that got you to that point. So there's a uh, give and take there. I'll just add on. Um, in the world of healthcare IT, there are open source projects. Um, some of them are actually very successful um, and predominantly used in developing countries. The problem is um, every health system is different. So sometimes when you develop a common model, you pleases no one. And if you calculate, although the software is free, your time uh, may not be. So it's really hard to measure sometimes. I've seen uh, projects where they take open source project uh, software. Um, yeah, it's free, but uh, the level of customization, um, manpower costs, uh, I tell them, well, you're better off actually buying commercial off the shelf because at the end of the day, someone has to support what um, has been customized, and th that's a cost. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's... Um, in, in fact, the United States Veterans Administration, which is part of the federal government that looks after uh, our retired soldiers and members of the armed forces, uh, had a hospital information system, I think they called it VISTA, that was open source, and their idea was, big thing, the crowd will maintain it, and we will have the best system forever. And in fact, there were two companies. One of them was looking for investment at the time I ran into them. And they even got some investment. It's all a complete failure for exactly that reason, 100%. It looks shiny because the software is free. The rest of the story is not so free. And so the, now the Veterans Administration is trashing their entire project. And I don't know what they're going with. But they're certainly not going with the original software that they put into the open source community. I have a question for you, Pedro. I was really intrigued to listen to your presentation this morning. Now, you're a professor, you're a doctor. Uh, no, I'm not, well, <laughs> if you want to know, I'm a naval engineer, so. Well, it says, it, 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 it says <laughs> But professor. I teach in a business school, so. Uh, well, you're not so a medical. I'm not a medical doctor. You're not a medical doctor, and that's the key to my question. What leads a, a person who's not a medical doctor to be so inspired to do this? What was your, your real driver? You know, so. I'm a researcher. Apart from being a professor, I do research in the sources of innovation, what we call user innovation. And to be honest, before studying healthcare and the role of patients, we were studying the role of users in financial services in the, develop, develop, in the development of new solutions. I mean, for instance, we studied crowdfunding. We created a crowdfunding platform that actually is quite successful. And it was just the same thing. You know, again, we were starting a new field looking at healthcare, understanding the role of patients. And 
what was similar was the process. Again, I was talking to audiences about my research, and what was different was the impact. And again, when I was talking before about banking innovation, nobody really cared. And now, when I was talking about healthcare, people were like, wow, you know, everyone relates to healthcare, right? We all know someone that has a disease. We all know someone that eventually has a fatal disease and is going to die. Uh, so, you know, how did I got involved with this and develop the project? Well, you know, because people sort of pushed me to it. Uh, uh, because, you know, I was giving talks and in the end there was a line of people that wanted to talk to me and some of them said, I would like to give you money if you would like to take it. And so we took money from the Peter Prebilla Foundation because they wanted to give... Peter Prebilla was a, 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 a manager at Siemens. He died with a disease and he gave his money to a foundation. And some of the foundation money came to us, which is nice. So if you have money, you can also share it with us. But, you know, so some people wanted to give money, other people wanted to volunteer their efforts, and some of these people were Nobel laureates. And other people, you know, wanted to bring the topic to the United Nations, and they brought the topic to the United Nations, and the United Nations thought, we should bring this to emerging economies, and we'd like to help you to do this. And we are now talking with the United Nations Development Program to bring this to emerging economies. So, so why did I do it? Because... I was pushed to do it, <laughs> but because it's truly something that is quite uh, amazing in terms of the impact that is having on people. Uh, I feel that I'm helping people already. I mean, as soon as we open, it's quite amazing because uh, as soon as we open this, we start getting feedback from patients that were saying, it works. What I saw there works, it's already helping me. Last Christmas, for the first time in my life, I started getting Christmas cards from people that I didn't know that said, your research is so important, this project is so important, please don't give up. You know, I'm a patient from Canada, you never heard of me, but please keep doing it. I was like, wow. Again, I mean, when I was doing financial services, nobody was sending me <laughs> postcards. I, I stopped getting Christmas cards years ago. My question is that I, I see the value in using a crowdsourcing platform for co-creation of ideas and finding solutions for, for potential cure and, and patients. Uh, my question is that, can the platform be used for such things as clinical trials of, let's say, potential new drug or devices? Because in the traditional way, uh, this is a very strict control process in terms of selection of patients, administering the drug, etc., etc. So I wonder whether the panel, people like Richard or Pedro, can share with us whether this has been done. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah clearly, in fact, uh, it was no accident that two of my slides dealt with clinical trials. One of them showed a bunch of companies that I found that I know of, one way or another, that are looking at contributing both the design of the clinical trial and the execution of the clinical trial. And the most important part, in my opinion, is going to be when the regulatory agencies, and there's optimism that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration will nibble here, is where they allow a crowd-sourced model. It'll be controlled, so it won't be just, you know, unfounded opinion and contributions of data, but where you will have a crowdfunded, mo a crowd-sourced model for the purpose of uh, determining uh, the efficacy and the safety of the drug. Well, the safety first and the efficacy second. And that's where, and then the slide as I showed today is, you're looking at 10 years and a billion dollars of safety and efficacy all in one series of trials. And then at the other end, either you fail or you succeed, and if you succeed, you still can fail. Like, again, I'll use the example of Viox again which is a phenomenally useful painkiller except for the few people that it kills. When you want to have, when you use crowdsourcing, you can break that up. You can actually have shorter period, in fact, perhaps with even more patients for the safety side, and then the efficacy can work its well, and you can do crowdsourcing there too, but the efficacy part can be crowdsourcing, and you can also use it to determine, again, what is the pharmacokinetics model for the drug? Who does it kill? who doesn't kill, who should we give it, who, how much, and the dosing. 
uh, again, one of the companies I'm incubating is looking at dosing of drugs, and it's a very, very complicated model um, affair to find these pharmacokinetic models, which is how you how each individual metabolizes a drug. Uh, and this platform will become successful. The biggest barrier is not the concept, is people adopting the concept. Oh, we've always done it this way. We have the army of scientists and engineers and regulators all doing it that way, and I need to go home at five, so why should I want to bother changing? But it will change. Adam? Uh, just to add on, I think for clinical trials, because there's different phases, and um, sometimes for phase one and phase two, there are difficulties in identifying patients. So crowdsourcing is actually a good way um, to identify the correct type of patients. You'd be surprised, you know, physicians have um, <coughs> difficulties at time identifying the correct patient. I think definitely uh, if, m if implemented, I want to say manipulated, if implemented properly, <laughs> crowdsourcing can be a... And, and an enabler uh, to clinical trials, yeah. Anything to add, Pedro? Yes, so, I mean, often the inability to recruit patients is one of the problems associated with clinical trials. If you think about rare diseases, it's hard to find patients, uh, uh, which also shows that some of the protocols don't make sense, right? If, you, if there are no enough patients to test the drug, so probably you need to go with what you have. Uh, um, you know, for instance, our platform is a place where patients meet. Uh, so recruiting patients is relatively easy there because they are there. And uh, there's a lot of potential that we are now exploring. Pharmaceuticals are talking to us and we are trying to see how we can collaborate. Uh, because we need to do something about it. If you think about rare diseases, and there are 7,000 rare diseases, it's quite remarkable that we have for those 7,000 rare diseases 400 drugs. And just this year, the, in 2013, the, United, the, sorry, the European Commission was all excited because now we were developing drugs at, at uh, an accelerated rate of development. And we did some small calculations, and these people were all excited about the fact that for you to have one drug per disease, it's going to take us, collectively speaking, another 700 years, which means, you know, there are... 400 drugs for 7,000 diseases. For you to have 7,000 drugs for these 7,000 diseases, you'll need another 700 years, which is probably not helpful for many patients. Uh, not to mention that, of course, this means that drug will work, right? It's just a drug. So, of course, we need to do something about it. And crowdsourcing for sure can help because the patients are out there. We just never found a way of bringing them together in a way that is helpful for everyone.